I'm hitting the record button. Okay, everybody. So I just wanted to start off by introducing Dr. Makeka Overstreet. This is our February meeting and we are so excited to have her. She was at ECU and is in the process of transitioning to, is it the Hunt Institute? Am I saying that correctly? Okay, so she has had lots of experience with literacy and diversity and teaching adult learners as well as um, student learners. So we're really excited. She's even a belly dancer. She's got all kinds of diverse, interesting experiences. And so I hope she'll share some of that with you guys. And we are really fortunate to have her. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to her. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful introduction. I do have a strange collection of skills, but you know, they keep life interesting. So I am grateful to be here today um, and to get an opportunity to talk to you all. It, as you know, probably from existing in this climate, it's a little weird um, to talk to, it feels kind of like you're talking to yourself. So please feel free to, um, post questions in the chat or to engage in, in, in whatever way you see fit, especially um, I'll pause periodically for questions or um, just general comments and thoughts and feel free to you know unmute yourself if you wanna pop in there. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about something that is familiar um, to most teachers, which is, and, and educators and librarians, all those good things, which is books as mirrors, windows and sliding glass doors, um, which is, from Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, and is a wonderful way for us to look at making sure that our students are having diverse literacy experiences. So I always start by um, going blank on my slides. That's not how it's supposed to go. There we go. Um, I always start by talking a little bit about myself. I think it's really important for um, anyone who is wanting to do work around diversity, equity, and inclusion to be very clear on um, where they're coming from because none of us come to a, a teaching space and shed the rest of ourselves and become like robot teacher. We all have experiences and expertise and um, knowledge and cultures that we bring with us and that impacts how we interact with kids, how we perceive um, situations and so on. So I, I, again, from a place of um, transparency, like to start by talking a little bit about my experience. So I, um, in this infographic, kind of broke it down into my scholarly experiences, my personal experiences and my professional experience. So I am um, formally a professor I was a professor of literacy instruction at East Carolina University until Monday. Yeah, a couple days ago. Um, and I'll soon be a literacy specialist at the Hunt Institute. Uh, prior to coming to North Carolina to um, be a professor, I was a professor and the director of minority teacher recruitment at the University of Louisville. Before that, I was a literacy consultant for the Kentucky Department of Education. And way back in the dark ages before that, I was an elementary school teacher um, and it was amazing. And each step has been amazing along the way. So I bring, I'm bringing all that with me. Um, I have a bachelor's in elementary education with an emphasis um, in learning and behavior disorders, K-12. I also have a master's in literacy and a PhD in curriculum and instruction. But with all of that education and all of that experience, I'm also still very influenced by my personal experiences. I grew up um, as what we consider an at-risk child um, with not a lot of hope for my success based on um, poverty, based on um, the education level of my parents, all the kind of things that researchers take into account when they're considering who's at risk, and that's me. Um, so it's interesting having gone from being that kid who everybody was counting out to being someone who is now navigating the middle class. Um, I like to joke about how I knew when I hit like officially middle class and it's when I realized that I have a second refrigerator in my garage just for drinks. Somebody said that's how you know that you got it when you got that older, not a, you know, not the shiny chrome one the older refrigerator that's just out there to hold extra drinks. And so that's 
That's what I joke about. Um, I am also a black woman, which most certainly impacts. And then being a woman, as well as being a member of the LGBTQ community. So all of those things influence how I experience the world and shapes the way I see things and the way people see me. Um, so I take that into consideration and also share it up front so that people know where I'm coming from. Also sidebar, if you're interested, <laughs> if you're interested after this talk, you can always find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Dr. Makeka or on my website, and I'll have my contact info at the end as well. So the big ideas that I want to talk about today are going, are like the, 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 the core of what we're talking about here is that who you are affects how you teach. It matters. It matters, your experiences, your culture, your knowledge base, all that matters. Who they are affects how they learn. Just like when we come into school, we don't leave our, our whole selves at the door. They certainly don't. Um, they don't have that skill set yet anyway, but they are bringing them whole, their whole selves to school and we want that. There's no one size fits all for culturally responsive instruction. Um, if anybody hands you a package and says, here's your culturally responsive instruction kit. You should just laugh in their face because that's not, that doesn't even make sense. How would it be responsive to the kids in my classroom when somebody handed it to me? You have to know, you have to know your students. Um, and also culturally responsive instruction, culturally responsive pedagogy, it's more than just activities. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of reflecting and growing and approaching your, uh, approach, approaching education as a whole. So here are a few of the questions that I, I'm not gonna ask you to answer out loud in any way, um, but these are just some of the things I want us to be thinking about as we're um, talking and, 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 and learning today. How diverse were the neighborhoods I grew up in and the schools I attended? Often people's education, their, their views of education um, especially all the people who love to tell us educators how to do what we do, they're basing it on their own sort of K-12 experiences. They think they know about school because they've been there, but we all have been there. And so um, what sort of influences were there in your K-12 schooling experience? How diverse was your neighborhood and your school? Um, what type of interactions did you have with individuals from backgrounds different from your own? Sometimes, we have so few opportunities growing up to interact with people with different backgrounds that if we have one really negative or one really positive, that that kind of shapes our view of a whole group of people because we haven't had that many experiences. And that's something that we can reflect on and, and look back and know, oh, okay, now that I think about that, this is what has shaped that. Um, and who, who helped to shape your perspectives of, of people from different groups? How were their opinions formed? Um, obviously, when we think about what our parents have taught us and what their parents have taught them, there are some um, biases and misconceptions that might be, um, you know, that, that, that might have been passed down or taught to us. Um, have I ever harbored prejudiced thoughts toward people from different backgrounds? Um, I, I, I would say yes, and most of us probably without realizing it. Um, so if I do harbor prejudice thoughts, what effects do they have on the students I encounter who come from those backgrounds? And all of that aside, the biggest question that I always ask my pre-service teachers this every semester to think about, what do I believe about teaching? What do I believe about children? And then how is that reflected in the instructional decision I just made? the environment I've created in my classroom and how I interact with students and families. So, you know, if you say you believe all children can learn, but um, there is an English language learner in your classroom who you're a little uncomfortable calling on them, you just think that this isn't, this isn't kind of my job, they need more than I can offer. Does that match, do your beliefs match your practice? Does it match your action? Um, so, we want to be courageous in confronting our own biases and in, in, in moving beyond good intentions. We all, I mean, I am always 100% ready to assume positive intent when, when educators are involved because I know 
that none of us went into this for the glory and the you know accolades oh, yes. and piles of money. And I, I know that's not why we're here. So I I know that we're coming from a place of good intention, but moving beyond that to continue to reflect on how our intentions do or don't align with, with our practices. Um, and the only way we can do that is by being reflective lifelong learners. So just as a quick warm up, um, again, this is not something that I'm gonna ask you to share. It's just something I want you to think about. So I want you to, if you have a scrap piece of paper, you can jot it down or you can just you know, think about it in your mind. But I want you to reflect on your identities in which categories, and this is, this is an older um, matrix and matrix of oppression, it sounds really ridiculous, but, but <laughs> nonetheless, it does help us think about different aspects of um, our identities. And some aspects of your identity, in, in some of those areas, you might be in what's considered a more privileged position. However, in some of those identities, you might find that you're in a more targeted position. And in some of those areas, you might just be in sort of that border group. So notice which categories you're privileged in and which categories you're um, targeted in. And beyond that, Think about which of the identities are most salient for you. So in other words, which of those categories matter most to you personally? You know, um, for, for me personally, race is very salient for me, but that might not necessarily be because I chose it. That tends to be because that's what people have noticed and targeted me for in the past. So my race, I'm very aware of it and how um, it impacts the, the different aspects of my life. Um, for a lot of women, especially, you, you know the challenges we face just by being women and some of the um, patriarchal misogynistic issues that we encounter. So just thinking about these different areas and I'll stop talking for a moment and just let you reflect. So if I completed that reflection, mine would look a little bit like this. Um, I have several of the targeted identities, um, being a woman of color, um, being a woman, um, and also being bisexual, which is one of those uh, border groups actually. I also though am privileged in that I am a Christian a middle class. Um, I, at least here in the United States, have the privilege of being an English speaker. Um, I'm also monolingual, which is, is not something that I am particularly proud of at this point in my life, but it works. Um, and But then I also have um, anxiety and I've dealt with chronic illness in different times of my life, but I'm better now. So I was only temporarily in that kind of, uh, targeted area. So these are just things to kind of think about and take into account, especially when you're, as we go into these next um, areas, when you're thinking about your instruction and you're thinking about your materials and you're thinking about the decisions you make without trying to, with no ill intent, sometimes we come from a place that is very much informed by our identities. So when you're thinking about, okay, the books that I have in my classroom, who's reflected in them? Is it a lot of the pieces of my identity that's reflected? Not a judgment thing, but a, just something to notice and recognize and say, okay, now which of these identities are missing? Which might, which might I add? Um, what, what areas do I need to have a good thought partner in? Someone who might have a different perspective that I don't have who can help me make um, some decisions for my students. So now that we've thought a little bit about ourselves and knowing who we are and where we come and what we're bringing, we know that the first thing we need to do 
for it to be successful at culturally responsive instruction is to know our readers. We know our kids. Um, you can't teach them well if you don't know them well. Um, and you've probably heard from Marzano that positive relationships between teachers and students are among the most commonly cited variables associated with effective instruction. Um, again, educators, we often hear a lot of those kind of cheesy, right, like sayings and, and models like, um, they, they don't care how much you know until you know how much, until they know how much you care or however that saying goes exactly. But there is some truth to it. You know, once you're, once you've built these relationships, you can get a lot farther with students than if you don't take that time to get to know them. And so once we know our students, once we know our children, we're able to start and I start to identify um, and provide books that can be mirrors and windows and sliding back glass doors. Um, and so I am actually wanting to read this quote to you from Dr. Rudy Sims Bishop, who originally coined this phrase, this, uh, that terminology back in 1990. She said, books are sometimes windows offering views of the world that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created and recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as part of the larger human experience. Reading then becomes a means of self-affirmation and readers often seek their mirrors in books. Recently, one of my um, favorite cartoonists, um, Grant Snyder, stretched this, stretched that phrase out further and I liked the image and so I wanted to share it because in addition to mirrors, when mirrors, windows and sliding glass doors, books are warm blankets and springboards and escape hatches and quiet corners and all of these wonderful things, which is why we can do so much good work when we have the right materials, when we have the right books. Um, and by the way, because I am, I am an unrepentant book buyer and book pusher. So on the slides, um, as we go through, there will often be books, book covers, and these are all books that I like and use and recommend. So if you're looking for some, some suggestions, um, paying attention to the slides, you'll see lots of, of, of good options to look at, had some up there. And, uh, so let's talk about books as mirrors for a minute. A mirror is a surface that forms reflections and when you look into one, you see yourself. So a mirror book will contain reflections of you. And a mirror book doesn't have to be something that reflects all aspects of your identity we can often find mirrors in books that aren't necessarily about us. Um, so while people definitely seek out their mirrors in books and we want kids uh, especially to see themselves, people of their race, cultures, genders, families, religions, and so on, we want them to see that in books because that shows them that they are a valid and valued part of the curriculum. There are definitely some people who get a lot more um, mirrors than others and people get a lot more windows and it's very essential that everybody has both. Um, and so when you're looking at mirror books, remember it doesn't have to be a, a perfect reflection. Um, I grew up as just a voracious reader and some of my favorite things to read don't didn't necessarily look like mirror books on the surface. Um, for example, I really really loved um, The Hobbit. I loved uh, The Giver. That was one of my favorites. Um, and some of those books. And, it's, and when I was growing up, there weren't as many books with like black kids in them. But I kept finding things in these books that I did like. You know, sometimes I like the escape and, the, and to step into a different world through a sliding glass door. But I tell you, when I read um, um, A Wrinkle in Time, I identify with angry little Meg 
even though we have very different backgrounds. So just remember that mirrors can look a lot of ways. And I am periodically linking at the chat. So if you did, again, if you did have something that you wanted to say or wanted me to address um, before I get to a pause point, please feel free. So when books are windows and sliding glass doors, it is a way to look into the worlds of other people. This is something that can help, um, especially, you know, we, we can't all live in the most diverse cities or travel to all sorts of places, but books can provide that window. Books can allow us to step into other worlds and other lives and help us to better understand other people. Um, it's, it's an amazing way to build empathy and just understanding and again to see the value and validity of all people, um, which is why as, as, as important as mirror books are, we don't want to forget about window and, and sliding glass door books. It's an, it, I don't know um, if, if you feel like I feel, but I think we could all use a little bit more empathy and the understanding of other people. Um, so providing these windows and sliding glass doors is one way we as, we as educators can help with that. So I am going to take a moment to share my favorite read aloud book um, with you and to talk a little bit about how you might use this book, not only to provide quality literacy instruction, but to um, provide but to, but to be able to learn more about your students in the process, as well as to provide some students some mirrors and some students some windows, okay? So if you, I don't, I don't know if I saw any familiar names, but if you've ever been in a class or anything with me, you know this book, so bear with me. It's my fave. It's called Honey I Love by Eloise Greenfield. I love, I love a lot of things. A whole lot of things like my cousin comes to visit and you know he's from the south because every word he says just kind of slides out of his mouth and I love an illustration it says hey cousin um, and a great prompt you know, when I first read a book I want kids to get that rhythm so I wouldn't stop so much on the way through as I would on subsequent readings but the character, the main character is immediately talking about her family and what she loves about them. So tell me about your family. Tell me what you love about your family. And remember that family has a broad definition that family is, is both what we're born into and what we create for ourselves. So um, that is one of the prompts and I won't read them all, but I'll have some more prompts on, on, on these other slides. Um, I like the way he whistles and I like the way he walks. But honey, let me tell you that I love the way he talks. I love the way my cousin talks. And the day is hot and icky and the sun sticks to my skin. Mr. Davis turns the hose on, everybody jumps right in. The water stings my stomach and it feels so nice and cool. Honey, let me tell you that I love a flying pool. I love to feel a flying pool. You can see the standard that I included there, thinking about word choice and figurative language, um, because I have had to have a conversation with kids a few times who took that quite literally. Like, do you really think she's in a pool flying for the, through the air? What do you think she means by a flying pool? Oh, that's right, the water hose. The day, um, Shoot, see, I have this one memorized and don't have it next to me because I know it so well. And now my brain just cut off for a second. Renee comes out to play and brings her doll without a dress. I make a dress with paper and that doll sure looks a mess. We laugh so long and loud and hard. That doll falls to the ground. Honey, let me tell you that I love the laughing sound. I love to make the laughing sound and The car is packed and crowded and there's lots of food to eat. 
we're going down the country where the church folks like to meet. I'm staring out the window at all the cows and trees outside. Honey, let me tell you that I love to take a ride. I love to take a family ride. And my mama's on the sofa sewing buttons on my coat. I go and sit beside her. I'm through playing with my boat. I hold her arm and kiss it because it feels so soft and warm. Honey, let me tell you that I love my mama's arm. I love to kiss my mama's arm. And it's not so late at night, but still I'm laying in my bed. I guess I need my sleep. At least that's what my mama said. She told me not to cry because she don't want to hear a peep. Honey, let me tell you, I don't love to go to sleep. I do not love to go to sleep. But I love, I love a lot of things, a whole lot of things. And honey, I love me too. So, there's a lot of work we could do with a fun read aloud like that. I tend to use it at the beginning of the school year or um, as a first day of class reading when I'm working with my pre-service teachers. Um, it allows me to do some community building work. Um, oftentimes I'll have them uh, make a name tent or with kids I've made little books where they share several things they love and one thing they do not love. I also might use that in my morning meeting during our lightning share. All right, we're all going to stand up and I want everybody to think about either one thing you love or one thing you do not love. And now this is a lightning share. Lightning is fast. So you have to be ready with your idea. And it's okay if you have the same idea as somebody else. It's good. We love some of the same things in here. That's great. And then I let them go around and share. And the reason I love this for that purpose is because even your grumpiest kid can actively participate. You know, you're going around and everybody's naming the things they love. And, and you got one, well, I don't love school. Well, thank you for sharing. Good job. You're doing exactly what I asked you to do. It's fine. Let's go. Keep moving. Um, another fun thing with this um, is I used to teach my kiddos when they heard something that resonated with them or that they wanted to say me too, instead of doing that, you just like snap like you're at a poetry slam and you're like yes yes I'm feeling that and so we would be standing in our little circles and somebody be like uh I I love pizza and then you have a little bunch of little kids going yes like pizza pizza is the best <laughs> and then there are always a handful of them who couldn't snap so they would be going <laughs> and we snap their little fingers and you know some of those things are just for my amusement but they work um to keep my kids from like I said yelling out oh 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 me 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 which is, and we would use this also as prompts for cross the room if, cross the room if it's a quick, easy game, especially if you have a few minutes before the lunch line, which before lining up for lunch, but not enough time to really get into anything. You just have them in two lines on opposite sides of the room facing each other. And you say cross the room if, and you finish that sentence with whatever, like cross the room if you love to take road trips with your family when people start walking. And I tell them before that too, like, you don't have to walk around like, oh yeah, I love, I went with my mom to a trip. Don't, shh. If you're walking, that means that this thing I said applies to you. So cross the room if you love pizza, you do not have to tell us what kind of pizza you love. You just gotta walk across. These are just little um, community building things that I've done around this, um, helping me get to know my kids, helping them get to know each other, especially like when we like and share. Um, and then, I've built up a lot of goodwill. They like this book. I've read it passionately and they think it's great. So I got them hooked. Now let me use it as a bridge into my literacy instruction. So um, recognizing and producing rhyming words is an important phonological awareness skill. So I might spend some time um, reading passages and asking them which words rhyme or asking them to help me generate more rhymes and moving into when we do word work and they're working with word families, we've built up from Honey I Love and we can use some of the patterns and families that are in this book and also build into some more, um, more common uh, word families and patterns. And I, I didn't just start by handing them a worksheet with a billion things on it. I built 
up to it. I've got in some, some of that relationship, so they're willing to do this work for me. Other early literacy ideas, um, you know, when we're doing phonological and phonemic awareness, we need lots of good pictures. We need songs, we need rhymes. So take pictures or find pictures um, for, for that are familiar to your kids, or you can take, like I said, take them around the school or around the neighborhood. Use familiar songs from, and poems in, from in and out of school, even if it's excerpts from, from popular music. Um, Again, this is thinking about the same good stuff we always do and just thinking, how can I make it more responsive to the students in my space? How can I make it more engaging? You know, when they're doing uh, words that rhyme with at and we're looking at hats and cats, it doesn't have to be just a, a clip art cat or a clip or, you know, just a, a ordinary old cowboy hat. We could, again, be offering mirrors and windows, perhaps you're very familiar with black lady church hats, you know, and that feels like, oh yeah, that feels familiar to me. That feels like my grandma, I can, I can see that, you know, um, there are ways to, again, offer windows with things like a prayer mat, you know, and it's not like this is some great big um, lesson that you're gonna do around these pictures, but you're just offering them different pictures and showing them different things. Um, let's take a moment and think about just that little bit. What other ideas does this give you? What is something you could try in your classroom right away? And how might you expand on or modify these ideas? Again, I wouldn't expect you to just go, yeah, what well, she provided and pick it up and go. What works in your space? What might your children respond to? Um, so take a moment to think, and if anybody wants to share out or share in the chat box, I'll pause for some think time, um, and I'd be happy to hear whatever you might have to say. <laughs> I see Vicky's comment about cross the room if activity. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do things that allowed them to wiggle and move and get some of their energy out but also to express themselves without everybody talking at once, which is, yeah, why we built in the things like the snaps in, in solidarity or, yeah, cross the room if was a lifesaver for me on, on many occasions. We had a fire drill and that fire drill ruined everything and I don't have enough time to get to math before, to do get into my math lesson before lunch. So I got a room full of squirrely kids. Let's, let's play some cross the room if, you know, and, and then letting them, um, letting them get, choose the if, the cross the room ifs gets really interesting. Like cross the room if you love Fortnite, cross the room if you like Among Us. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but yes, I'm so glad y'all like it and y'all are bonding over it. Yes, yes, we love Among Us. I don't know, can't keep up with the kids, but um, yeah. And the kids did, they always, uh, the, the snaps, they did like doing that even when they couldn't, because I, I showed them though, I showed them a poetry slam and how the people were snapping and they just thought, I mean, yes. Oh, so, it's, they're feeling it so deep in their souls. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add or share? I will keep moving. So we talked about knowing your readers as one way to implement more culturally responsive literacy instruction. Another idea is to share lots of great books. As I said, I'm a book pusher. You can see that I have book, pictures of books on every single slide. And I am always going to encourage kids to pick up more books. Um, I mean, how did you hear about the last book you read? What did you do after you finished the most recent book that you really enjoyed? You talked about it probably. Somebody told you about it. I have um, not, you know, across social media, but also just people in my life who I am constantly getting reading ideas from and sharing reading ideas with. Just today, um, you might, some of you might know Dr. Elizabeth Swaggerty, who's also at ECU. Um, she texted me today and said, uh, add 
what is this book she picked? But she does this to me all the time as if I don't have enough on my to be on my to read list. But it was add the little you, nothing to see here. Not, add nothing to see here to your gotta read list and then read it and talk to me about it, which is also <laughs> a very typical thing that I do to my friends. Like this book was so good and I can't stop thinking about it and I need somebody to talk to about it. So please read it so we can talk. Well, we want kids to have that same feeling too, right? We like, we want them to be excited about the things they're reading and be so excited about it that they wanna share it with others. Um, and so one of the ways we do, we build that sort of desire and passion in them is by demonstrating it and allowing them to, to um, share and, and try out lots of great books. So children should choose their own material most of the time, but they need exposure to a book flood to determine what books they like and learn how to choose their own books. That's from Donalyn, Donalyn Miller. And I like that phrase. She wrote uh, the book Whisper. I think it's the name of that book. She was, um, I don't know why my brain is blanking on book names today, but I think it's the book Whisperer that she wrote. Um, and I just love this idea of a book flood. Like, I want to expose you to so many good books that there is no way you can't find something you want to read, you know? And so doing lots of, um, doing lots of sharing, but also, also providing your students that space for choice is sometimes hard for teachers. And so like there, there are levels and ways to kind of approach that. Um, for example, if I am really trying to get my kids to read more books on their reading level for whatever reason, then I am going to have a variety of books at that level still though, like, and still give that semblance of choice, you know? I'm not gonna say you have to read this one first and then this one. Here are a bunch of great books on your level. Read, read all you want in this box. <laughs> so there are different ways to approach it. Um, introduce authors and books through read alouds. I know that anytime I did, I read a book aloud to my class and then dramatically placed it in the classroom library, I knew it wasn't going to stay in there for very long. I mean, I, I, again, I did it on purpose. I know if I read and talk about a book, I love it so much the kids aren't gonna be able to wait to get their hands on it. Um, create frequent opportunities for children to preview, share and select books. So again, um, book talks, allowing kids to do book talks, you doing book talks. If there are ways you can think to allow kids to share what they're reading with one another, whether in their groups or if it's a part of, of, of something you do in your day. Um, and again, it's been many, many, many years since I had my own classroom of children. Um, and so I know that things are different and, and often challenging, but I do recall that every week I would send home a newsletter um, to parents and mostly it was things like, here are the words for the week and here's this and that information they needed. But on the back, it was just a one pager. I don't mean to sound fancy. Like I did a real newsletter. It was not that big. But on the back, there was always um, an article written by some kids in the class based about something we were doing in class and there was always a book review by a kid and that was one of the many avenues we used to share books with each other so I mean and the kids were working on these weeks weeks and weeks in advance but I soon found that any time one of our one of the kids had a book review in there that again inevitably that book it becomes a hot commodity and you know it's always getting taken um, out of the classroom library and passed about and talked about. Um, then increasing children's access to books is very important. We know that, of course, all of our kids don't have equitable access to books. So our classroom libraries, our school libraries are huge ways of trying to remedy that, as well as, you know, finding and offering printables and books like that. I've always thought of, because I know you sometimes can send things home and sometimes you can't, but a lot of times um, we would find printables from things like Read Native Z. You can have this. If you lose it, it's okay. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, oh, read, reading what your kids are reading and then having discussions with them, it's, that's such a validating way to say, hey, I think what you're doing matters. I, I like I, 
I see and hear and I, I, I want to share this experience with you. That's beautiful. And takes me right into the final point, which is above all, validate the children's book choices when they select their own books to read. Try not when if you're if you have a student who is choosing a book of their own accord and they want to read it, validate that. You know, um, fight the impulse to encourage to 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 say, well, that book's too hard or that book's too easy or that book's let them read it. Um, I <laughs> I did um a little time over at the ECU Community School where we were working on books. Uh, and each kid had their own book basket where the teacher put books in there for them to choose from to read. And I remember how excited they were when everybody got their book baskets out for the week and the teacher had changed. We had we had worked together to change out all the books. And so it was their first time seeing what was gonna be in their basket. And one little girl pulls out, there's a Clifford and she goes, <laughs> Clifford is for babies. She puts it down and she's looking at the other things in her basket and she keeps kind of glancing over. And then she goes, but I love Clifford. And she like holds it to her chest. And I'm like, you know what? It's okay if, if, if you think that maybe Clifford's a little bit easy, that's all right. Readers reread books all the time. Readers read things that they love just because they love them. So it's okay if you think, I don't think Clifford's a baby book because I like Clifford too. But it's okay to reread a baby book if you like it. That's important. And she was just like, okay. And then she's over there just devouring this Clifford book. So those moments, like she needed someone to validate that that was an okay choice. Now, actually, it was on her reading level because it was in her basket. So it wasn't really a baby book, but we didn't have to tell her that. <laughs> As you're doing this, and you're looking to share lots of lots of great books. Think about the work that we talked about earlier and the reflecting and um, review your book collection. Again, the opportunity to critique is, all, is, is not necessarily an opportunity to criticize, it's just for you to notice and think about what areas you can grow in. So who is represented in your books, especially who is widely represented. Then who's not represented, Present it as a monolith or misrepresent, which is um, kind of kind of like what I mentioned earlier. But if you don't have a lot of experiences around people who are different from you, and you have one negative experience with somebody from a particular different group, it can really shape how you see that whole community. Well, if you only have one book featuring, say, a Muslim character in your class, and nobody likes that book. It's like you're not you're presenting this as a as a monolith or, or possibly um, misrepresenting the culture if you don't have the best of the books. So just thinking about where where are where is my collection rich and robust, and where can my collection um, grow and and or where do I just need to supplement? Because again, I am not a person who is here to tell teachers to spend all their money on stuff. I know we do and we can't help it sometimes, but you know, this might be, I'm gonna check out these books from the library to have in my classroom for a, a little while. Um, and again, all the books on this slide are books that I have read and loved and used around kids. So, Thinking about who, who is our population in the United States, in the world, we are preparing our kids to be a part of a global, global community as well as a citizen in, of our nation. And so we know, and these are all, all of these things are a little dated, I still need to update, but in 2017, we knew that at least 7.7% .7 of the population of our children were being raised by LGBTQ parents. And we also know that they were not necessarily seeing their families represented in classrooms. And I wonder what that makes a kid feel like about their family if they never see a family like theirs. The other thing to think about when you're thinking about who's represented and who, who aren't, um, who authored the materials you do have. So you may have heard a lot about own voices. 
in recent years. And that's where we're working towards pushing the publishing industry to publish books about diverse groups of people, but also by those people. Um, so as again, thinking about who gets to tell your story. Um, and so in 2017, there were 134 um, children's books with, and this is including elementary, middle, and YA, all of that. There were 134 books that had um, LGBTQ characters or content, but only 21 of those were written by a person from that community. That's a problem. You want your materials to be representative of the people and to be have that authentic voice. And a lot of times when I talk about, you know, our our student population, people are still kind of under the under the impression that schools like school is like what school was like when they went through. And even if it's not in your community, looking across um, the nation as a whole, our schools, our school population for many years has been what they call majority minority, where more than 50% of the students in American schools are students of color. Um, so we know that our population has grown more and more diverse. And when you're looking at Generation Z+, plus, that's people born since 2007, so they're in their teens now, but even looking beyond that, you can see from this um, graphic on the right here that it, they're, they're a diverse group. And whether they're in your class or not, again, we're preparing people to be a part of a diverse world. And other school-aged people are racially and ethnically diverse. So we want to make sure that they're getting those windows and those mirrors. Um, these next few you've probably seen before, so I'll just go through them rather quickly, but it's just a reminder as we're thinking about who's represented and who's not and what we want to have in our classrooms. Um, the Center for, I do this every time, collaborative something something at, the, <laughs> at um, University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, they, they do this every year where they look at all the books that have come out for children and they look at the numbers and they really only look at race. Um, but you can see across the past few years um, how many books that they got from publishers and how many of those were by um, people of different races and also when they were about. So notice something like in 2018, there were 3,320 new children's books that they analyzed. 194 of those were by Black people, even though 390 of those were about Black people. So it's like a multi-tiered sort of um, challenge within publishing to look at. Like, yes, we want more people represented in the books. We also want those people to be able to tell their own stories. So we have different levels. We want, But we want other people to tell the stories too. It's not saying we don't want any books by somebody about somebody, but we want those numbers to be more representative. And these next three, like I said, are very popular. It's still CCBC who gets that information, but then they have an artist who does a graphic for them so that we can get a sense, um, just a real visual sense of race and ethnicity in children's books. And so in 2012, when they first did this, you could see that 93% of the books, the main characters um, were white characters. And then you can see 3% Black, 2% Asian or Pacific American, 1.5% uh, about Latinx people, and less than 1% um, about um, Native Americans. And then they kind of re refined the categories and things a little more as we got into 2015. And they brought in the idea of mirrors here. And so you can see in 2015, 73.3% of, of the books featured primarily white characters. So you see here that um, this child sees all sorts of mirrors. He can see himself as all sorts of things, a king, an astronaut, a, a criminal, a firefighter, a baby, like there's all of that. So he's getting lots of different mirrors and seeing himself as lots of things. The next most popular category is animals or other um, or, or animals or inanimate objects that have been personified, like 
trucks that can talk or stuff. Um, that was about 12.5%. And while I understand that the sentiment is that, all right, all kids can identify with animals, so I'll put animals in. I, I often challenge people because that's what people usually say to me when I share this slide. And I say, well, I would like to invite you to think about why you think white children might identify more with animals than with other kids that just happen to be from different races. So like we, we, we can move past thinking they won't identify with these other children because they're children. Um, and you can see again, the numbers went up between, um, the representation improved between 2012 and 2015. You know, it was 3% of, of books were about black kids and now 7.6% in 2015. This is the most recent I have, which was 2018. And in 2018, you can see a few things that the, the artist added, which included the mirrors um, of the kids of color being having cracks in them because when you have so few mirrors, often the images are distorted. Again, you might be presented as all people who all, all um, American Indians are this way. And that's not what we, you know. And I bring that one up in particular because usually it's like, either in the Thanksgiving books or, and you're like, that's not, that's not the whole of those people in that culture. And also we need to stop looking at American Indians for people, First Nations or other um, indigenous people as historical figures. Like they are still very much alive in here and living lives just now. Um, and so in 2018, you can see that the 73, the, the used to be 93% of books that were all about white characters became 73% in 2015. And in 2018, finally really started to match our student population, which is 50%. However, and the others went up as well, but darn it if those animals didn't go up. So even while things got kind of redistributed and the, pop the popula population of the books and the population of school kids match better, they still aren't quite shifting in all the right directions. I see a hand. Oh, you know what? I, I see your question, Emily, about um, first voice. And I, I am not 100%, but I think what that was about is saying we should be the people who get to tell our story first, more so than, you know, we want, we want people of those cultures to write about those cultures, but also that's who we should listen to first as the expert. And Tiffany's iPhone. Is that a real hand up? Tiffany, are you trying to unmute? Okay, well, if if it does come back around, you just chime in and I'll pause for you. Okay, um, oh my goodness. How does the time just fly? Is it because I talk so much? Probably. I see what time it is. So let me keep moving. I would also just like to remind everyone that diversity is broader than race and ethnicity. Um, it's kind of, like I said, I know that it's a salient point for me. That's why I pointed it out at the beginning. Um, but we should think beyond that. What about ability? That's a huge one to think about, especially um, if we are trying to just be representative of all of the plethora of people that we have in our communities, looking at differently able people is very crucial, as well as thinking about um, things like religion, which is always touchy, um, but it's not that you wanna teach kids a different religion, it's just that you want, again, to build that empathy. So I have on one of my slides, like the book, The Proudest Blue. It's a beautiful book just beautiful, visually just beautiful, but also it shares that experience of, you know, what it's like to, to what, what the hijab represents for this girl, even though her schoolmates don't quite understand. Like, these are just empathy building opportunities. Um, 
I will gloss a bit over this, but since I was talking about sharing good books and sharing books diversely, remember when you, can, when you don't have time for a read aloud or you just want to continue to be introducing your kids to great books, do a quick book talk. You know, channel your inner LeVar Burton and go back to the Reading Rainbow days where you're just like, I tell you about this great book. Tell me fast. Leo Lynn, The Honey Bears. It's a, it's a, version of the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Three Bears story, um, but from the African-American community. And it is absolutely adorable because little Leola lives with her grandmother and she's a bit naughty and mischievous. And she, she um, is supposed to be playing near home, but she gets distracted by uh, blowing some of those daffodils and then chasing them and ends up in the forest and eventually finds her way to an inn owned by some bears and lets herself right in, even though her grandmama told her that you are never supposed to go inside people's houses unless you've been um, asked. She goes in any way and all sorts of fun antics ensue. So something like that, just showing them a few pictures, talking a little bit through the book and then putting that book in the library they won't be able to wait to grab it. Speaking of which, I did touch base on this earlier, but make time for choice reading. You know, allow kids to choose books to read independently sometime. You know, obviously there are things that they have to read and things that you'll read together, but also teach them how to choose books and let them do it. Um, because as uh, Kate, De Kate DeCamillo says, Reading should not be presented to child as a chore or a duty. It should be offered as a gift. Also, independent reading is just as important, if not more so, um, than your teaching your ELA skills because it makes reading a habit. It's a skill for kids to see themselves as readers, to consider reading a part of their identity. And it's important for several reasons. If you choose books for them all the time, they lose that self-motivation to read and they lose some interest in reading. When we empower them to choose in these early experiences, it helps to set them up as lifelong leaders, uh, lifelong readers. Um, also, book choices tell us a lot about our students. So again, we're trying to get to know our students. If we see what they pick, it helps us to learn about their dreams, the, their interests, um, and sometimes why they act the way they do in class. And um, also, and when students have the opportunity to talk with each other about their books, they have the opportunity to form the new relationships and build a true learning community. So again, taking all those pieces together, knowing our readers, sharing lots of great books, making time for choice reading, and thinking and reflecting all along the way. Keep in mind that who you are affects how you teach and who they are affects how they learn. No one size fits all, but when I say that it's more than activities, it's a way of thinking and reflecting and approaching. I also like to tell teachers, give yourself permission to start today. Give yourself permission to start small. There is no, you all work too hard. There is no, oh my goodness, I'm not doing culturally responsive pedagogy, let me throw it all out and start all over. Let me read everything that's been written about it and look up all this stuff from the past, mm -mm, start today and just find one small thing. It could be, you know what? Next week, I am going to read a book with a character of a different race to my class. It could be that I'm gonna start incorporating book talks into my daily instruction and introduce lots, you know, several diverse books over the course of the next few months. It could be as simple as, you know what? I'm going to take 10 books out of my classroom library every week, look at them, see who's represented, who's not, and think of, and, and, and make some decisions about some future purchases. Just give yourself permission to start small and start today. A few resources that might help you in this journey. My colleagues, Ann Tickner and Christy Howard and I have a book. Um, it's called It's Not One More Thing, Culturally Responsive and Affirming Strategies in K-12 Literacy Classrooms. Lots of great suggestions and ideas in there. 
not just because I wrote it, but because we very much wrote it in response to the how question. Like this is this book is not full of the why, why we should do this, why we should try culturally responsive. It's okay, yeah, I get it. I, I see it's important, I wanna do it, how? That's what this book is about. Um, I also write, uh, I have a literacy blog on my website. Um, it's called my, my Monday Message. So you can always get some ideas there. And I write for Book Riot, which is an independent editorial book site. Um, so those are places where you might find resources. I, it's all about books, period, on Book Riot. So all ages, but a lot of times my writing is about kids' books because that's my, that's my jam. That's my area. It's my lane. Um, and then in addition to that, if you're on Twitter or social media and you just look up the hashtag, hashtags on voices and we need diverse books you'll often find good resources what we do all day.com has tons of lists it's like books to empower girls books to teach empathy books to promote um love of science they just have bunches of stuff i love that website and of course learning for justice amazing resource they used to be called teaching tolerance but now they're called learning for justice great website full of resources and lastly, before I stop and go into questions, um, I just want you to think about how you might implement these ideas in your context. So I always like to end with a so what or a what now? How, how, how can I do something with the information that was just presented to me? So what might you be able to apply right away? How can you educate yourself to add more inclusive ideas? What resources will you need to be able to do it? What trainings might you need to attend or reattend? And who do you need to follow on, on Twitter or other social media as, um, outlets? I have found that some of my best professional learning comes from the people that I follow on Twitter. Edu Twitter, as they call it. So I'm definitely going to take questions now, um, but I want to leave the slide up with my contact information. Um, I'm always happy to hear from teachers. I'm always happy to support teachers. Um, as of February 21st, I'll be a literacy specialist at the Hunt Institute and you'll be able to reach me at that email right there. Um, but now and always, you can catch me, like I said, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Dr. Makeka. And now I will officially stop talking. Um, did I do it? Oh, I went, I went a little over, I'm sorry. All right, questions, comments, concerns? I have a question for you. So in an elementary library, that's my setting and, you know, rural community that um, sometimes is very set in their ways and opinions about certain types of books. And so my question is, how do you work through the increasing the LGBTQIA plus books without having 50 bazillion book challenges because I know in our district there are teachers and librarians that are fearful of the backlash based on the book bans and all the things that we're seeing right now and that seems to be a hot button area in particular so I want to represent those families and our students we've got non-binary students we have even in the elementary level they're there and I want them represented but I want to also protect myself if that makes sense because I know how it is right now <laughs> Oh, you're absolutely right. It makes perfect sense. And that's a valid question and something that I'm always trying to be cognizant of. Um, our kids, um, I've, I've written about this quite a bit too. Kids start to know their gender identity around two or three. They have a very clear sense of this is, you know, this is how I feel on the inside about who I am. Um, and then it's not very much later before they are aware of, even if they're not, because we're not trying to talk about like attraction and stuff at the elementary level, but they start to know their sexual orientation very early or get a sense of it. I mean, we're doing, we're reading fairy tales that end with kissing and marrying and happy ever after from the start. So they know how things are supposed to look. They're getting married on the playground. They're doing, you know, so the ideas are already there. It's just, imagine being a kid who does not 
match the norms and now you're really feeling confused about yourself or your family or whatever but at the same time teachers are attacked way too much and it's scary and you got to have your job and you got to eat and I'm never going to tell you to do something that endangers your job or your career Um, but at the same time I really want to be mindful of the kids needs so what I try to promote is making your decisions um, hard to, hard to argue against, like in advance. So, you know, being, being transparent that these materials are here, or I'm going to use this in my classroom. Here's why, here's the standards I'm working towards. Here's the options. Um, because the kids always, they all are pre-service teachers, especially always say, what about the parents? And I say, which parents? There is a very loud minority that gets catered to because they make a big ruckus but there are more parents on your side than you would think um and so I try to remind us that you know we're we're educating for all the kids not just this group and this family um and it's a little different in the library for sure but I know that the library is such a like you do so much of the work for teachers too, like as as a support to a classroom teacher who maybe can't have the book in there, but you have the book, so huge. So one of the things I really do though, is think, you know what, I'm not about to teach an LGBTQ book unit. That's not what I'm teaching, but maybe I'm teaching about um, standing up for yourself or standing up for others, or, you know, I have some bigger theme to this unit. And I'm going to include a variety of books, including this one. And the way I try to get ahead of that is, you know, talk to my school leaders and also tell the parents up front. And whenever there are, um, whenever I have books that may be considered controversial, I often make it a choice. You know, like we have, this is the set of books and kids can choose from this for this particular unit or things like that, you know. If I'm going to read one aloud, then I'm just, here are the standards I'm working toward. Here's why we made this choice and and kind of go from there so that you kind of cover it from the front, from both ends. Um, and then honestly, do what feels safe for you though. So if at the end of the day, you just don't feel as if you can keep your job and have these books, then I would rather the kids have you, someone who wanted to have those books, than to not have the books and not have you. So, you know, I know that's not the perfect answer, but I do also have some resources related to teaching LGBTQ books especially and how to address parents and how to address. So I'm always happy to share those. So if you'd like, I could definitely pass some some supportive resources from people smarter than me um, along. That would be great, thank you. Oh, thank you, Hannah. I appreciate that. I think the one thing that as you're talking about the importance of choice, which I'm in a middle school library now, so they definitely have choice, but the fight over AR levels and things like that and kids wanting books and it is it sometimes you can feel like you're beating ahead your head against the wall, but keep up the good fight <laughs> because I know y'all are doing it. And bless you. Bless you all for continuing to do that. AR was the bane of my existence as a teacher like it's such a it's such a double-edged sword sword that AR because it's like it's motivating and it's but a lot of times my kids would not be able to tell you what that book was about or they were just picking avoiding good books because they weren't worth enough points and going after books that they didn't like or couldn't read well for more points and yeah, AR and I have a complicated history, but I'm so, so glad that you are <laughs> in the library trying to help mitigate that for kids. Well, that's it.
that is all I have, but please don't hesitate to reach out uh, if I can be of any support in future and, or if you just, I don't know, need some ideas or if you just want to tell me, I mean, sometimes people just find me to tell me what a terrible idea I gave them. <laughs> that's, that's where I am at this point, and which makes me feel pretty accomplished. Like I'm at the point where I have people emailing me to say, oh, I, didn't, I didn't like that article you wrote. I'm like, oh, well, okay, I'm do, doing pretty well now that I actually have hate mail. So whichever, whichever way you wanna go with it, just reach out, I'll be here. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. McCake, so much. This was wonderful. Um, local council folks, um, Miss Terry, if you have any items for us as far as housekeeping stuff, y'all are welcome to unmute. And if you're not part of the Crystal Coast Reading Council and want to jump off, you are welcome to do that. I'm going to stop the recording now. And